Our guests are CEO of Toyota Research Institute Advanced Development, Inc., James Kuffner, Vice President of Robotics Toyota Research Institute, Max B., and your moderator, Brian Heater. But before they come on, we're going to throw to a quick video. Thanks. for intro music. <laughs> you guys feeling pumped? Yes. <laughs> James, as we were saying the last time we spoke, I was in your neck of the woods in, in Tokyo. I was very jet lagged. I'm sure that you're a little bit tired now. Max has come all the way from the South Bay, so he's doing just fine. Uh, I wanted to actually start, so what we're watching right now is kind of the breakdown of what TRI and TRIAD do. TRIAD is a pretty uh, recent addition. I think uh, construction or the offices just opened, what, in January, something like that. So if you could break down the differences between TRI and TRIAD and where TRIAD kind of slots into the larger Toyota ecosystem. Sure. Uh, we founded TRI in January of 2016. Uh, Dr. Gil Pratt is the CEO, and I was a CTO there, and our mission is to really find uh, what is next. Um, no need to say it in front of this audience, but to make a working robot, you need excellent hardware and excellent software, both. Uh, if either one is weak, you have a weak system. And um, Toyota actually started out um, as making power looms for automated weaving. Sakichi Toyota saw his mom knitting and, and said, I think we could make a machine to do this better and founded uh, uh, Toyota Looms. And, um, and then his son, uh, Kichiro, made a huge pivot, took the profits from that business and started a car company. And uh, our current president, Akio Toyota, is now looking at what is next and where can we apply Toyota's skill in making excellent hardware and now make excellent software and look for those new capabilities. So Toyota Research Institute is really about finding new capabilities in automated driving and safety and robotics and uh, the advanced development TRIAD company does the development work that's needed to make a research prototype an actual product. I, I, the way I would break it down and correct me if I'm wrong is Max gets to do the fun stuff. <laughs> Max, absolutely. Max gets to sort of dream <laughs> these things up, and then James, it's your team's job to do the hard work of actually putting them into practice. It is true that uh, no need to say this here, but making a demo is one thing, but making a product is yep. a completely different thing, and uh, trying to cross that bridge. Great. So, Max, let's talk a little bit about what your team is doing in, in terms of, of robotics. Um, at this point in 2020, what role do robots actually play in the, the Toyota ecosystem? Yeah, so it's actually pretty interesting. Toyota as a company um, doesn't use nearly as many robots in its factories as you might expect. Why um, is that? Yes, yeah, so the philosophy is that we believe that robots really should be amplifying people, not replacing people. And so if you go to a factory, you'll see, you know, there's some robots doing what robots do, but actually for the most part, the robots are assisting the people. So if you mm. see a person you know, mounting a tire, there's a robot there assisting the person to gravity offload it, but the person is really using their own intelligence um, in order to, to, to do the assembly work. And the reason that, that that works so well is that the workers are then empowered to actually improve the system, make the, make the factory line better, faster, without worrying about losing their job to a robot. And so we at TRI are actually taking that same philosophy, and rather than kind of going for the low-hanging fruit, which I would say is in logistics, manufacturing, mm -hmm. places where we know robots are, are actually going to empower people, we're actually going for that long shot and putting robots into homes. So instead of going where you can make a lot of money right now, <laughs> you're getting a little bit more theoretical. 
I, yes, absolutely in the sense that I think Toyota uh, has this vision of how are we going to have a social impact and how are we going to help people. If you look at aging society in Japan, um, it is a crisis that's coming and we mm -hmm. believe that technology and in particular robots are going to be an important part of solving that problem. Again, not to replace people in their, hum in their homes, but to amplify and assist them in their homes. But that is an incredibly challenging place to, to operate in, and we believe there's definitely you know, important major breakthroughs in capabilities that are going to need to be done in order to achieve that. So that's where we're focusing on those capabilities. And then once we've developed those capabilities, that's where James's organization comes in. How do we actually get them out into the real world with real people? You know, Toyota is, is looking at building a city where we can actually start experimenting um, with these types of ideas with real people. So how much of a head start uh, do you get in the robotics space when you know, you're, you're, you're both of your bosses, Gil, Gil's team, is working on these self-driving cars? How much does that actually inform the robot research? I think um, building a system, you have you know, the classic you know, perception, planning, action, loop. And all of these require good tools. So a lot of people have talked about simulation. We use that a lot. Um, Max's team has been building some incredibly you know, sophisticated simulations for simulating grasping and those kinds of contacts. We've been using dynamic models for vehicle control and testing and validating, essentially doing regression tests. And now that we have cloud computing, we can do large-scale regression tests and use that to really do quality control and find and fix bugs early. Those are things that we can share. It doesn't yeah. matter whether you're building a manipulation system or a self-driving system. You're going to leverage the cloud. You're going to leverage simulation. And cloud robotics is something I've been thinking about for a long time. And uh, how can we leverage uh, massive parallelism to run these simulations and then get back answers quickly that, hey, uh, statistically, I can show that uh, this system is more capable, or I find corner cases and fix them. So we've got a couple of more videos to show. I want to start with the first one, which is uh, going to be, I think, a bit of a surprise to people. It's a, a dishwashing robot. Um, so let, let's, let's roll that and take a look at, at that in action. Max, can you tell us a little bit about what you're, we're saying right now? Sure, yeah. So what you see is a uh, standard you know, uh, industrial arm. And the goal of this robot is to basically take a, 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 a dish, a, a sink filled with any arbitrary objects and be able to load a dishwasher, discard objects that don't, don't go in the dishwasher, um, or be able to pull out the rack, load the plate, uh, load the silverware, um, grab them all out of, out of the sink. And so, so we're cutting between two separate things. So th this is the demo right here, and then there's a real world robot, there's or are those connected? There, so these are actually connected. So um, just to be clear, uh, we at TRI don't believe that a dishwashing loading robot is a product, right? We are doing this because it's a challenging research problem, and we feel like if we can address this problem, then it has many, many applications. And what you realize is this is such a challenging problem that you know, you, you're basically always finding corner cases in the sink. Like, how do you, you know, what is this object? How does the robot pick it up? What does it do with it? Every case is a corner case, and we can't do enough real-world testing like this. And so it really forces you to go into simulation and realize how can you use simulation to find these corner cases and then automatically either repair your system or synthesize behaviors to deal with these corner cases. So rather than us also trying to take simulation and kind of bridge the gap from sim to real, what we're actually looking at is can we make a simulation that's statistically similar enough to the real world where we can use it to repair behaviors and even learn new behaviors um, for the system to deal with the complexity that it's, that it's seeing. So uh, again, as you said, I mean, it sounds like the odds of Toyota or some part of Toyota coming out with a dishwashing and loading robot are pretty low at this point. I think that's, I think that's <laughs> safe true, to say. but okay. as you can see, I think once we're able to achieve this level of, of capability, yeah. um, you know, we look at James's organization and say, well, okay, here, here you go. Now, what could you do with this? Could it be applied to homes? Could it be applied to logistics, manufacturing? I think there's a lot of places now where you have this capability of synthesizing new behaviors from simulation that you could find real products that could make money. For the right so price, start, I would buy I a want to get to this, robot. I want to get to this <laughs> dynamic of Max's team is like, hey, we built this dishwashing robot. What can you do with it? I, I think, for me, 
this project, which I'm excited about, is about capability and manipulation. Um, they've done some studies of what people do in their homes, and something like 80% of what people do in their homes is pick-and-place operations. Right now, our robots are not really good at pick-and-place of arbitrary objects, whether it's setting the table, cleaning up, decluttering. There's all kinds of manipulation of objects in unstructured environments, and that's a missing capability. And TRI's you know, state-of-the-art simulation tools, their motion planning tools, their perception algorithms, all of those things could make a significant dent in achieving the capability necessary to solve a, maybe a, a meaningful statistical chunk of those problems that we face every day. And that I'm excited about. That I would like to build a business and product around, but you know, we do need to challenge the capabilities. I don't think we're there yet. I think these problems are really hard. Um, Max, I want to get to something that we, we talked about earlier when we were sort of circling around which videos we should play. And um, you said something that jumped out at me, is, which was, hey, let's show a video of a robot kind of messing up or you know, of, of not like executing the task exactly. Why is that important? I, well, I think it's important for a bunch of reasons. One is that we don't want to set expectations too high. Um, our robots are going to mess up. And one of the nice things about being, for example, a home robot that's there to amplify and assist people is unlike a self-driving car, if you mess up, the consequences can be a lot lower risk. And so you can you actually- drop a dish. Exactly. Yeah. And you, maybe you ask for help, and you're a little bit more like a, a kid who's trying to help, but maybe you mess up, and you want to be able to be taught. And so we really build that philosophy into how we think about these systems. And so we think right from the beginning, how can we make a system that not only can it adapt, but how can it work with people so that people could teach it to get better? And then you actually feel sort of this sort of empathy for this robot that's trying to help you, and you're also helping it. And you creates this dynamic where I, hopefully you, you actually appreciate the robot, and you leverage the fact that we still really don't have the technology to do the jobs that people do as well as they do them in their homes. So do you, I mean, do you get the, the sense, though, then some of these uh, companies that show like these super polished videos on YouTube that you know perhaps they're doing a a disservice to the people who are doing the hard work behind the scenes. James is laughing. Well, you don't have to name any names. No, I mean, no, can. I'm just saying, uh, you know, I, I started out um, teaching computer science and robotics at Carnegie Mellon for, for many years. And um, one of the problems was if you go to a conference, you will see a video, and it might be the one time it worked. Yeah. And um, yeah. it's unfortunate that they that They don't show happens. you the blooper reel. Yeah, and um, <laughs> it sets this false expectation. And then, of course, the general public uh, will see intelligent robots like Terminator or you know, uh, C-3PO. And, and Hollywood sets these also artificial expectations. And I would have problems. You know, I um, co-founded the robotics effort at Google. And, and I would sometimes show to executives. And, and they would say, I saw a video of a robot doing that 10 years ago. Yeah. And I would say, you don't get it. It actually works. Yeah. <laughs> and, it, and it's very robust. Yeah. But you know, that, that is a big difference. And it's the difference between making a demo and making a product. Like, uh, this is really hard. And you know, our philosophy at uh, Toyota Research Institute and uh, TRID is you know, make it work, make it work well, make it work cheap in that order. So capability, robustness, and then cost. So I actually want to use that to transition into the next video. If we could start rolling that now. Um, and, and I guess the flip side of that question of the downside of showing some of these demos is if you show somebody this you know, very capable, in a lot of ways, home robot like this that can do a lot of things, are you setting unrealistic expectations? Yeah, so we try very hard in all of our videos to preface it with, you know, look, this is still a research system. We don't think that even this mobile manipulator that you see is necessarily the end state of what a product will be. Even though maybe we all want to imagine Rosie the Robot or something like yeah. that, I think the real state of things is going to be more special purpose uh, you know, robots that are doing certain things like cleaning. We use this system as a research tool to get into real homes, to try out many different types of problems, to understand, to learn. Um, here you see an example of the ability to teach the robot in virtual reality, um, seeing what the robot is seeing. So doing these things, like being able to teach the robot in virtual reality, tells us 
hey, a human is smart enough to do this task with this hardware. You know, you can actually do a lot with these two gripper fingers and these hooks. Um, a human with human intelligence can do almost any useful, you know, not super dexterous task in a home. But we don't have the software to be able to do it, and so we're working on, on teaching it. Um, but we really try to preface it with we are not at the level of robustness yet where this could be a product or something um, that you would actually have in your real home. But we are working on you know, very challenging problems to make a useful robot in the hopes that we will recognize, oh, now we understand that a cleaning robot could be practical. Let's work with the, the advanced development organization and the product organization to try to take those ideas and, and productize it. I, I've seen a lot of these uh, videos recently with somebody wearing, like, for some reason, they all seem to be wearing the Vive headsets. That <laughs> seems to be the robotics VR platform of, of choice. Um, what role does that ultimately play? I mean, is that just, is that the research phase? Is that you guys working on things behind the scenes? Or, I mean, is that going to be actually part of like productizing when these things are out in the real world? You know, do you foresee somebody kind of going through doing a once over with a VR headset on? I, I would say for us, it's very much a research phase. Um, it was the way to recognize, you know, could we have a person performing the task behind the scenes and have the physical hardware capable of doing it? How could we teach the robot? And then if we could teach the robot, then how could the robot be able to execute that based on learning the data that we've given it? However, we have certainly learned that teaching in virtual reality is pretty clumsy. It's pretty slow. Yes, you can be remote, which is convenient. Um, but I think that the end state is really that the person who's in the home is really going to be the one that's helping the robot, teaching the robot. So I would say for us, virtual reality right now is a crutch that lets us get the data, lets us teach the robots. In the future, I envision being able to teach robots in person you know, while interacting with them in a safe way. Um, but I think we're just not there yet. So again, you know, these two specific pro robots are probably not going to end up in most people's homes. Uh, James, can you take me through the pipeline from there? You know, um, it sounds like Toyota definitely has its sights set on home assistant robots for the aging population. How do we get there from here? So the Toyota production system has become a legendary way to produce electromechanical hardware manufacturing at scale with good robustness and good cost efficiencies. I think w our goal is really to bring the same quality and the same cost effectiveness of developing software. And of course, software is less like construction, but more like gardening. You're always like growing it and, and fixing it and pulling weeds. And, uh, and so in that sense, um, our goal is to take the capabilities, take the software libraries, and it's been written with some amount of discipline with you know, unit tests and documentation and regression tests and good cloud-based tool chains for CIT. All of those things basically we erect to make it possible for a researcher to spend time trying to solve the research problem in, instead of fighting infrastructure battles. That's something I'm very passionate about is trying to have the right tools. And um, we take these prototypes and then really look at, can we find bugs? Can we fix them? Can we um, make uh, something that's performant? Can we optimize for uh, efficiency? And also, you know, as a system, produce a system at scale that provides value. And I think the key is, where are those products going to be and what kind of value and how are they received by users. Um, again, this is going back to Toyota's philosophy of human-centered automation. Um, we shouldn't build technology just for technology's sake. Mm -hmm. It should be to support happy, healthy human life. And that's the whole reason many people were interested in our announcement about the Woven City um, that we made at CES is how can we build technology that people actually want to use and not the other way around. Like, here's some technology, use it. <laughs> so so as, as we transition into that topic, um, you know, I, I sort of want to nail you down a little bit on like what, you know, as you said, we're heading towards this crisis of an aging population. What's a realistic expectation to actually start seeing some of these Toyota robots in the home? Yeah, I think we're already, um, you know, a lot of people, if you've had a chance to come to the, uh, World uh, Fair that was in, the World Expo that was in Aichi in 2000, 
five, Toyota had a whole marching band of robots yeah. and things. Um, that and were demonstrations robots have replaced all musicians the yes. world, so we've gotten there. We have, uh, you know, demonstrations of capability yeah. and prototypes, but, you know, um, we are now really looking at can we build robust perception systems? I used to spend a lot of my time about motion planning, and um, one of the things I realized, though, is that even if I had the perfect motion planning algorithm, if I didn't have reliable perception output, it, the robot was going to do something wrong. And so I realized that reliable perception, an environment understanding, a good prediction of, of the environment uh, surrounding motion is necessary, whether it's an automated driving car or whether it's uh, life in a home. So I think those are still unsolved, but we're making incredible progress, and then finally I'll be able to use a perfect motion planner <laughs> to, to, to make it uh, capable. So getting back to this idea of living in the future, back in January at CES, Toyota got on stage and announced, hey, we're not just talking about cars and robots here, we're actually launching a city. Uh, your president, I think, jokingly called himself the Japanese Willy Wonka. <laughs> got a good laugh out of the crowd. Uh, so two-part question, what is a woven city and is it, you know, like real and stuff? So it was a personal project of President Akio Toyoda who wanted to um, help the city of uh, uh, Fukushima and the Tohoku region, which suffered after the 2011 great tsunami that not only lost life and business and economic damage, but there was a, a second uh, disaster in the sense that a lot of businesses pulled out, people weren't buying products, and so he said, I'm going to build a factory there, create thousands of jobs. But in order to do that, he had to close another factory, and so what to do with the land that was in Shizuoka? And so he turned it into something really exciting, which is a place to actually test these technologies. A living laboratory of robots, clean energy with fuel cell technologies, uh, robotics that will help assist, and smart infrastructure. Um, and also, uh, a lot of people don't realize that Toyota has Toyota Homes, which has built over 100,000 uh, modular housing units um, in Japan for 35 years. And so there's a lot of things brought together, but we realize we can't do it alone. It's a, it's a big project. There'll be thousands of people living there. We'll break ground next year, and phase one will have uh, over 1,000 people living there. We're open for partnerships. Uh, a plug for Toyota AI Ventures, who we're partnering with. If you have great new technologies for smart cities of the future, um, these are real problems. The world is concentrating populations in our urban centers, and these have problems of traffic and pollution and, uh, and mobility. And so mobility beyond just the traditional car, but personal mobility, uh, flying mobility, all yeah. these things are going to be in the cities of our future. And we hope that the Woven City will be a place where we'll invent the future and partners like Toyota Research Institute will create some of these capabilities for us. Yeah, and, and to emphasize that, I think that TRI is really focused on those far out capabilities, but we use um, like our, our Toyota AI Ventures um, team to invest in shorter term uh, startups who can provide value and actually bring products to market. Um, so it's a really bit of a tiered approach to how do we solve this problem. Partner with people shorter term, mm -hmm. focus on the longer term research where other people might not be willing to invest in those, and then bring it all together in this idea of, the, of a woven city. So I've got kind of one more big question, I think, before we close out of here, which is, you know, obviously when most people are developing robots, they're very much developing them for the human world, right? You're developing a home robot that can work in the kitchen. It's built for the kitchen. Is this an opportunity to sort of flip the script and build the environment for the robot? I think uh, they can go hand in hand. I mean, obviously, um, the goal of the Woven City isn't the Woven City itself. It's really what technologies can come out of it that can be distributed all over the world. Um, so if we have too much infrastructure investment, I think that makes the problem too, uh, too easy and maybe not transferable to other you parts of like the world. You can't like rip up cities. Yeah, to, yeah, yeah. We have to make, I think, uh, you know, our technology backwards compatible with the rest of the yeah. world. Um, so, but you can actually potentially solve meaningful problems with minor infrastructure changes. And uh, we're really excited about that, exploring that space. What can you do in partnership with, uh, with civic governments in order to make these mobility solutions and robotics technologies usable to support happy, healthy human life in the future. Real quick, yes or no, are you both ready to live in the woven city? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we'll see you there. Thanks, guys. Okay. Thank you. Thanks.